I'm, I'm going to do three things today. The first thing I'm going to do is just give a, a quick reminder of what brought me here, um, the project. Um, and then I want to just lay out just a, a very specific uh, and uh, brief uh, account of what pictorial statistics, isotype, or pictographs, how they were theorized by the practitioners, and how they were criticized by, namely, um, the philosopher, uh, critical theorist, uh, Theodore Adorno, and then um, sort of work through uh, the materials that I found here at uh, this Wilsonian, and how uh, thinking about the materials in relationship to uh, the theories of the practitioners and the criticism uh, of uh, their use, um, how that raises a bunch of questions for my continued research on this topic. So um, the, the, these uh, posters, uh, many of which are within the uh, collection at the Wolfsonian, uh, and I showed them when I arrived here three weeks ago, but I just want to restate what my goal was, and that is to understand the historical significance of graphic visualization in general to reform-minded bureaucratic agencies. In my case right now, the REA, but it may expand now based on my research um, over the past three weeks. So for me, the Rural Electrification Administration, or the REA, has been a case study, um, or what I kind of think of as a, an example of provincial retrieval. And what I mean by that is that the REA uh, works with visual materials in the way that many other bureau bureaucracies, administrative institutions do. Uh, and uh, the, the, the conclusions that I'll come up with with the REA uh, will have implications for other bureaucratic or administrative uh, bodies that use visualization as well. So one of the things that I uh, began with uh, was that in terms of these posters, I have, through my research, refuted a long-held assumption that the designer, Lester Beale, developed these pictographic posters uh, to communicate uh, agency initiatives to illiterate rural population. And I did this uh, through some uh, archival research, uh, and uh, I did this, I came to this refutation based on two observations. The first one uh, relates to this artifact, electric power on the farm, uh, and it was an already, or it had already established the use of pictographs or pictorial statistical representation as the agency's graphic vernacular. This was in many ways what uh, both the agents, uh, the administrators, and farmers and co-op users were used to in terms of the communication of facts from the REA to its public. The second uh, means of refuting this observation was that I was able to establish the audience for the pictographic posters. Um, and uh, these were a sophisticated collective of co-op members, agency administrators, utilization experts, and farmers. And what I just want to point out here is you'll note on the lower right-hand side, uh, there is from 1939, the Colquitt County, uh, Georgia exhibit. And next to the pictographic posters are uh, the same size posters, but that are only text. And you can see here from one of the um, uh, ads for the posters, uh, for the REA, that you could purchase these posters, and they came with text. And this is an important observation because the pictographs never stood alone. They were always accompanied by some form of uh, textual uh, explanation in terms of what the pictographs were for. So um, this begs the question, or this, these observations beg the question for me, which was how effective were pictographs in communicating facts about the farm? And I think part of this also comes out of the fact that there's a shift in terms of how the posters were used. So the, only the first series uses pictographs, and the subsequent two series incorporate uh, photographs. And so given what was thought at the time to be the radical efficiencies of pictographic representation, uh, there, they were replaced with what could be construed as the photograph's indexical fact of being there, that somehow 
photography was uh, thought of as a, a more effective way of communicating REA concerns, both in the posters as well as other materials. So in terms of graphic yeah, visualization in general, the inclusion of text and the subsequent use of photographs begs the question of how, inform how much information can pictographs carry and to what extent are claims of pictographic representations universality always fraught with some kind of uh, ambiguity such that other forms of images or other kinds of textual representation need to be included with them. So because of that observation, I've been increasingly uh, becoming more interested in how images themselves interact and exchange facts and material properties. And so I went back while I was here uh, to look at uh, a small book that was published uh, in 1936 uh, these are two spreads, the photograph and pictorial statistical charts and diagrams for little waters. And what I found is that um, there was never, with uh, the exception of the case of those uh, Beale posters, the REA never exclusively used pictographic representation. It was always mixed uh, with other forms of visual communication. And they were organized or designed to correspond with, with each other. Um, and this is also the case, I think, in terms of um, all kinds of ways of presenting information in terms of the REA. So m one of the questions that I sort of come, came up with while I was here was what purchase does the pictograph have uh, on reform-minded communications? And its circulation suggests that it had quite a bit. So there are several instances where the same charts get reproduced in uh, different uh, 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 books, booklets, and brochures. So this is a spread from Little Waters, 1935, on the left. And on the right is Democracy at Work from 1942. Uh, first publication, 1939. Republication, 1941. But it's exactly the same amount of information uh, with some years in between. So uh, one would hope that, for example, either this, these two charts are meant to show how much uh, 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 loss there is to the land through um, inadequate uh, cultivation, uh, top, basically loss of topsoil. Um, and one would hope that there would have been some change in those years, but there's a continued use of, of the same image. And then the other question I have is to what extent the combination of pictographs and photographs uh, work to uh, package or to create a kind of network of facts, um, or how they might change uh, in terms of how we understand relationships that are uh, established between different modes of picturing here uh, from, again, uh, democracy at work, uh, a uh, pictograph in the lower uh, left-hand corner and a photograph in the l upper right-hand corner. Um, how these different modes of picturing um, sort of might make sense or might not make sense. So there seems to be, if you, and I'll get to this in a second, but if you uh, read the discourse on pictographic representation as it was first introduced by Otto Neurath in Vienna and then taken up by others for my purposes, notably uh, Rudolf Modley, uh, you would think that the combination of these two forms of visualization or communication uh, are redundant. The combination of pictographs and photographs um, are, are basically make the same kind of uh, claims. But increasingly, I think there's something more complex. There's a more complex network of relationships that are going on between forms of communication of facts. Um, what I am uh, tempted to call the material of visuality in general. So what, one of the reasons why this, is, th this uh, uh, is, I think, in some cases an important move is because when one studies these materials, one either studies the photographic material or the pictographic material, and never in combination. And one of the reasons why I think this is important is because there's a certain amount of intentionality inscribed or embedded in these texts. They're organized in a very specific, deliberate way. And trying to sort of get at what that, what, um, 
you might call the paratextual qualities of these books is an important aspect for, uh, I think, uh, a historian to pursue. So my time here so far uh, has forced me to pay uh, a lot more attention to these kinds of relationships. Uh, what one might say is their mutual exposure of graphic representation and photographic representation in REA publications and beyond. And let me just say that the images up from now on will be exclusively from uh, the library, or, uh, unless I mention that they're from something else. So these um, uh, images from Neurath's uh, Society and Economy Atlas from 1930 might be familiar uh, to many of you, and they're the result of Otto Neurath, the Viennese logical positivist and member of the Vienna Circle, who founded the Museum of Society and Economy in Vienna. And as the director of that museum, it was Neurath who developed his pictorial statistical method. So Neurath used the term pictorial statistics at the very beginning of uh, his use of these objects. He later uh, used the term isotype or international system of typographic uh, picture education. Um, one of the things that he was, uh, what he's best known for is the standardization and popularization of this mode of communication. So. Um, one of the things that Neurath, and here's just a uh, uh, one uh, larger blown up image, he, Neurath developed this system uh, of statistical representation um, at the nexus of statistical research and social reform in Vienna after World War I. And um, his goal was to popularize statistics through pictorial means. He claim, his claim was that words make division and pictures make connection. And this, this starts the sort of more or less positivist understanding of how pictures communicate things unambiguously. And this has often been taken up in the literature uh, subsequently. Um, what, he wanted, what Neurath and his followers uh, wanted to do was to create narrative visual material that would allow the citizens of Vienna to make uh, decisions about their lives based on uh, factual, empirical observation of their underlying economic uh, situation. Um, one of the things that Neurath uh, made uh, decisively, or made a decisive point to reject, was the use of photographs, because to his mind, photographs were too concerned with what he referred to as surfaces and didn't reveal underlying uh, relationships. So for uh, Neurath, the important thing was to construct an image, not to just take an image of reality. The important thing was for him to create a critical image to expose um, the underlying uh, structure of uh, society based on economic statistical uh, information. Um, so one of the things that, and his, uh, his uh, colleagues in the, uh, uh, his logical positivist uh, colleagues were concerned with was basically um, uh, getting away from uh, the kind of uh, metaphysics of essences and so forth that photography seemed to pull out and to try and sort of expose these other aspects of information. The method was very, very popular in uh, the Soviet Union and in the United States. And in the US, it was so popular of a method that an important publication uh, by a statistician uh, known as Funkhauser added a very special bibliography on the Vienna method to his 1937 article. So he does an entire uh, sort of survey of uh, uh, statistical representation, but he singles out uh, the so-called Vienna method uh, for um, uh, highlighting. And one of the things that Neurath, well, one of the major innovations that Neurath did was pictographic representation had existed long before Neurath sort of came about in terms of delivering statistical information. What he wanted to do was sort of narrow down the images in such a way that they wouldn't uh, miscommunicate something, uh, that there would be a consistency of image. Uh, and so he, uh, in his uh, book, uh, international picture language from 1936, he gave examples of what he referred to um, as bad systems of uh, 
graphic representation. And so on the left, you can see uh, the marriage in Germany, uh, 1910 to 1926. And at the center in 1920 is a bride and a groom, but it's very large. And this issue of scale, uh, scaling up uh, the figures as a means to convey uh, quantitative increases, Neurath felt was, um, was uh, miscommunicating or misleading. Um, one thing uh, that he advocated for, which, was on the, which is on the lower right, is to cluster numbers in such a way that you could make easy comparisons along um, uh, an, a horizontal axis. And you can see that demonstrated here. These kinds of uh, uh, works, so these are both not from the collection, um, have been longstanding and they were codified very early on, as early as 1884, by uh, Mulhall in his uh, statistical uh, dictionary. And here you can see uh, the production of meat uh, in a variety of different locations, Australia having the largest cow and therefore having the largest production of, of meat. Uh, this is from the collection as well, and this is from uh, the Soviet Union, and you can see that this would be an example of pictorial uh, representation of statistical data pre-influence of Neurath. And these wonderful uh, postcards uh, from, I think, roughly 35, the date is, is unclear, but almost all the statistics uh, end at 1935, so it's probably roughly around here. You can start to perhaps see uh, the influence of Neurath, and you can absolutely see the no influence of Neurath in this really exquisite uh, al illustrated album of the State Organization and National Economy from 1939. Uh, uh, and here, uh, one more uh, image uh, from that as well. Um, I'm showing this too because one of the major concerns, of course, in the 1930s uh, was uh, rates of employment. And in the Soviet case, employment is doing nothing but going up. And the problem of unemployment is doing nothing uh, but going down. And I love this pairing of sort of leisure activities and photographic form on the left-hand side and the uh, increase of employment. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, the idea that, of course, the increase of employment would lead to greater leisure time because more uh, people are working, there are better um, work hours for everybody uh, involved. In the U.S. context, Rudolf Modley, who had worked with uh, Neurath in um, Vienna, uh, made some uh, specific innovations of his own, though he employed roughly the same method. Uh, the difference between Modley and Neurath is Modley writes a book, How to Use Pictorial Statistics, and he, in effect, theorizes his pictorial statistics in a way that Neurath hadn't. Uh, Modley says the correct pictograph has no dubious connotation. It is exact. Its meaning cannot vary as it passes an idea from one mind uh, to another. And this has always struck me, this observation. It's, it, it seems to make a lot of sense, for example, in this case, uh, for Modley's uh, contribution to uh, the United States of Graphic History from 1937, um, where you only see the pictographs alone, right? They're just uh, autonomous images that, while they're certainly uh, accompanied by um, uh, quite a bit of text here, um, this idea of the impact and the, uh, the nature of pictographic representation seems um, uh, pretty clear. Um, one of the innovations that Modley made that differentiates him from Neurath is he was very attentive to particularly cultural distinctions in terms of communicating pictorial statistics to a specific audience. So one of the things that he advocated for was greater flexibility in the production of pictographs, um, a much more pragmatic approach to the development of these graphic uh, materials. So on the left is uh, Neurath's or Gerd Arntz's uh, style of a laborer. But in the US, Modley adopted uh, a laborer that was more hunched back, perhaps more depressed, uh, not employed. Um, Generally speaking, 
uh, pictographic representation in the US and its method uh, for representing facts was praised across the board uh, as being simple, clear, bold, engaging, and accurate in the impression that it conveys. And this is, I think, in many ways still uh, the uh, much praised value of using uh, isotypes, pictorial statistics, or pictograph in infographics in the age of big data. One of the things is that these kinds of images continue to resurface because it's understood uh, that they are, in fact, clear forms of communication. And so you'll still see these being used, for example, in the New York Times on anything that they might use in terms of infographics uh, today. Now, um, one of the things I discovered while I was here is that there are other individuals uh, working on pictographs who are known uh, other than Modley. So here's one uh, Irving Geis one of his uh, pictographic representations for an advertisement for the mutual broadcasting system that appeared in Fortune magazine in 1937. This is a perfect example to introduce uh, Adorno's critique of not only uh, sociological positivism and its use of statistics, but also the use of pictorial statistics in order to convey um, this information. While Adorno was exiled in the US uh, during the war, uh, he had come into contact with pictorial statistics while working on the radio survey project with Paul Lazarfeld, a well-known sociologist, and had interviewed or had innovated the use of surveys as a way to target audiences and to produce effective advertisements. Uh, those of you who might be familiar with Adorno's work, this drove him absolutely berserk. I mean, he just could not uh, abide by this and wrote scathing critiques of uh, the use of survey and the idea of averaging the American and so forth. Um, what it does follow is something that's very similar to Adorno's critique of math, mass culture in general. Uh, he sees uh, statistics and its pictographic representation as emblematic of the loss of individual decision making under corporate and bureaucratic control. And he says that statistics tell something of a pseudo, tell something to the pseudo individual. Uh, what they are to think. And pictographic representation of statistic, uh, statistics only eases the delivery of the commands and control under this system. As Adorno claims, uh, statistical, uh, the statistics exist somewhere close uh, to um, uh, the use of, um, of uh, palm reading or astrology that they're meant um, to uh, promote a means to predict the future. And his goal was to point out something of the regressive nature of the belief in statistics, uh, which he thought was uh, nonsensical or as nonsensical as uh, astrology. Uh, methods of prediction, he thought, were too e could too easily turn into methods of control and deception. And this transition, I think, is really, really sort of caught me. Originally, these pictographs were used in Fortune as advertisements. They're very quickly, the very next month, taken up by Fortune uh, to uh, basically are used for their quarterly surveys of the economy and of business. And that move from uh, persuasion to fact giving is one of the slippages that Adorno was so concerned about. So the other issue is of course the same method of representation is being used for two very different ways to deliver information. One which might be factual and the other which may not be. Um, so one of the things that I started, I've been thinking about in order to answer the question of why did the REA switch from photographs to pictographs? Um, could it have been uh, have something to do with the kind of uh, concern uh, that people like Adorno had about the nature of pictographic representation in relationship to photographs? Um, they were referred to as deadpan, the pictographic res representation by um, the uh, REA administrators that work with him. And there may be, uh, or that may be something that's motivated Beale uh, to work what I think on what I think is more of a hybrid of pictograph uh, and photograph. 
Um, and so one of the things that sort of is helping me think through this is uh, I went over to the annex and looked at the Beale posters very closely. And in terms of their material production, there's something that sort of happens. Um, I'm showing you a couple of details, but one of the things uh, that is interesting about the way these images or these posters were produced is generally speaking, when you do a multi-color poster, you tend to uh, use the lightest color first and the darkest color last as each color goes uh, through a pass um, of the press. Uh, one of the things that happens is, is that the, the sort of um, contours of the images uh, in terms of color are used to trap, or what's you refer to in printing as trapping, the photographic image. And you can see there's just a little misrepresentation, uh, or misregistration, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side where that blue stripe uh, sort of uh, overlays uh, the photograph in, in such a way that you can see that the registration is slightly off. Um, this has led me to think maybe a little bit more carefully about um, for example, possibly at least tentatively submitting the idea that the original pictographs are carried through the subsequent posters as just shapes that are knocked out of uh, the photographs. And Beale did this very often, as you can see in his 1941 poster for Cross Out Slums, where he uses a pictograph or the shape of a hand uh, to knock out the image of, of um, a, um, a housing development. And so this relationship between the shape of a pictograph and the image of a photograph creating a kind of hybrid image is something that I'm interested in pursuing. So in thinking about this, this particular object, which is not related to the REA uh, at all, uh, captured my attention. Uh, this is Half a Million Forgotten People, the story of cotton textile works from 1944, um, which um, uh, which uses uh, quite a bit of pictographic representation. Uh, and I'm sorry these images are so small, I didn't realize that they would get so postage stamp size on this uh, screen, but in any case. Um, here's a close-up of one of the spreads where you can see um, the relationship between the photograph and uh, the pictographic representation. So this so there are two things that are happening here. At first, I was thinking about the posters as a way of combining pictographs and photographs. And I think that that's not a huge stretch, just uh, considering how Beale sort of produced images um, subsequently. Um, but it also uh, has uh, forced me to consider the proximity of photographs to pictographs in terms of this um, particular um, spread and thinking about how uh, the photographs and the pictographs are sort of drawn together. And in being drawn together, that is closer in proximity, they tend to draw meaning from each other. That what really starts to happen is that pictographs require allies. And those allies would be photographs. And photographs also require allies. And those allies might also be pictographs. There is a fairly uh, long history. This is uh, the Paul Kellogg's, one of the volumes from Pittsburgh survey, not in the collection. Um, but it is one of the first instances in which the use of photographs and statistical tabulation were combined in order to, uh, were combined within the social sciences towards reform. The photographs are famously uh, Lewis Hines photographs. And, um, but one of the things as you can see here um, that uh, the tabulation of statistical data and the photographs are kind of randomly organized and they're actually very far apart. So one uh, wouldn't be surprised that historians of visual communication focus almost exclusively on Heinz's photographs and completely ignore uh, the graphic visualization of statistics. But not too long afterwards, in um, American economic life, uh, which Roy Stryker was in charge of organizing 
uh, all of the images, and Stryker famously uh, was uh, the head of um, the historical survey portion of the Farm Securities Administration, you see the uh, images, uh, uh, the two different ways of conveying meaning uh, coming closer together. So this is just uh, an example from uh, the uh, American uh, e Economic Life from 1925, where there's a bar graph and um, uh, communicating uh, information about employment and a worker um, across uh, the other page. Um, since 35, these are examples of material in the collection as well. Uh, the WPA Division uh, of Social Research was involved in collecting data regarding uh, the Depression. Um, and uh, they produced uh, uh, multiple books and reports that are very reminiscent of American economic life, and they used photographs from the Farm Securities Administration. So all of these research monographs use charts, tables, maps, and photographs um, are very often uh, included. Um, and you can see, uh, again, on the right-hand side that the proximity of the photograph to the table is meant to create some kind of pairing partnership. They're meant to speak to each other in um, a particular way. Um, so what I'm showing you here is the recto, the one page which, when you turn it, is turned over to the verso, the other page, and that so this, uh, these, are, these two images here are one uh, uh, behind the other uh, page. And as you turn it, you'll see that it's exactly, it is the same photograph from a half a million forgotten people, but flopped and cropped. And the image is from uh, Dortea Lang, uh, her example of resettlement from 1936. Um, one of the reasons why I point that out um, is because all of the contextual information from the FSA uh, material is somewhat cropped out to give this a more generalized sort of uh, image uh, uh, more on the uh, half a million forgotten people end. Uh, so one of the things that's interesting about this case is that the photograph is a California uh, 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 migrants from Oklahoma moving to California, but half a million forgotten people is exclusively about uh, East Coast Southern uh, textile workers and unemployment. It has nothing to do with migration either. I don't. That's not some not to make a big deal about that, but only to say that these images could migrate uh, into many different uh, contexts. And the question is, to what extent uh, does the loss of context influence the way that they're actually uh, meant? Uh, so one would gather that clearly the image that you see here is not being informed. The photograph is not at all being informed by the context in which it was taken. It's being informed by the text, certainly, but also by its relationship uh, to the graph. So I, what I want to argue here is that these pairings uh, force us to consider the fact that photographs do not, in these cases, refer to anything out in the world, but refer to other images. And same thing with the tables and the graphs, that the graphs are meant to refer to other images. It's a chain of signification in which images only refer to other kinds of images, rather than referring to some reality out there in the world. And one of the reasons why I think this is interesting is because looking at these spreads, where there's a kind of continuity of surface, where what they share is surface, what they share is the impression of printing and ink, uh, forces that sort of confluence, that kind of pairing. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting here is this relationship, it looked very closely, is that there, it's, it's really quite complex in terms of how that photograph is meant to relate uh, to the pictographs. The pictograph chart shows workers and their hour, hourly rates in just uh, the cotton textile area, the sort of southern, uh, eastern part of the country, and comparing it to the rest. And we're unsure. There's no caption to this photograph. It's not referred to as a figure in the text. And we're unsure whether or not these figures are industrial workers through the rest of the United States or whether they're cotton uh, workers in uh, the, the southern uh, textile industry. And so there's a, there's a kind of complication that comes out of that kind of pairing. 
I don't think uh, it's a complication that creates a kind of misinformation. I think it creates a kind of dynamic between these images. Again, this idea of they're mutually exposing something of themselves uh, to each other. And that creates a certain kind of um, dynamic of uh, meaning. Um, so thinking along that way, I came across a, a lot of different ways of sort of uh, incorporating folk photographs and uh, graphic uh, representation. Here are spreads from the Right to Work, not an REA-related uh, uh, publication, um, uh, but from 1938, um, uh, drawn together from one of the figures, I, I can't remember the, the author, who was in charge of the WPA or was uh, working with the WPA. Um, and all of the photographs are uh, photographs of WPA projects. But this kind of sequencing where you see uh, a diagram of the economy, and I'll show uh, more details in a second, uh, on the upper uh, left hand, a diagram of the economy, and then it's interspersed with this narrative or sequence of photographs. And then the uh, diagram continues. And I mean, I don't have much more to say than I just find this to be, as a, as a matter of intentionality, a very intriguing way of trying to convey something about uh, the right to work in this particular case. So if I just produce this diagram on my own in which I want to kind of figure out, for example, why are the photographs so far away from the area of the diagram that the photographs are meant to be informing? Is there, uh, is there some sense of anticipation for when uh, public works start to kick in and the diagram changes? This diagram is, is, is pretty phenomenal as well because it shows, when you look at it very closely, it shows how the factories close down, how, um, how uh, housing turns from like an organized suburban housing or, or uh, urban housing to just shacks and the factories stay uh, sort of dormant. And then suddenly, money, you can see the arrows coming in from the state. And suddenly, you're back to uh, full-blown uh, employment and thereby uh, full-blown uh, housing. Um, I don't have anything more to say than I just think that this is just a really intriguing way way of producing these images. And they don't answer any questions. I mean, there's the logic here is probably maybe uh, impossible uh, to sort of figure out. But it's, there, it's, it's, it's not by chance that uh, I think that these were organized in this particular way. So in answering the kind of question of what difference would it make in terms of the sequencing of photographs and pictographs, I'm drawn back to uh, this initial uh, uh, Little Waters uh, uh, relationship. And indeed, what, this book too had photographs. And the question of how the image of gullies and so forth from uh, poorly cultivated land, the images are meant to play around with the diagrams and the pictographs is, uh, is an interesting uh, uh, question. But it's also reproduced in other contexts as well. Here again, that same image from uh, democracy at work is also uh, uh, related to these kinds of photographs um, uh, in terms of conveying uh, what both the, this chapter in the democracy book and what the book Little Waters convey is something, the fact of uh, land sterility uh, through these particular uh, images. Um, so there are certainly instances where uh, the, photo, the uh, pictographs are reproduced uh, in just pictographic form and where they're also accompanied by photographs. And I'm just showing you two examples here. There's also uh, moments where they actually, um, some of them trade off. So on the right hand side, uh, the same pictograph at different scales uh, is shown in terms of uh, estimated unemployment. And on the left, um, there is uh, an idea of, um, of uh, urbanization and its impact on migration, and they're treated in two different ways. So um, they, one is focused on um, the um, architecture uh, and, its, uh, and where it's surpassed by industry, and the other is just on urbanization. But of course, urbanization and industry are closely um, aligned. 
What might be uh, similarly interesting is um, to look at how the pictograph becomes something of a floating signifier that's applied not as a representation of statistical data, which increasingly becomes the case after 1937 in REA materials. Um, the uh, pictograph is applied as almost an illustrative uh, image rather than as conveying any factual information. But as a, a, as a kind of floating signifier where you can see this pictograph of the uh, farm wife with the refrigerator is moving between a lot of different kinds of stories. And if to follow the movement of the pictograph, like the one that I'm showing here, if it might reveal how the implementation of large scale electrification in the US relied to some extent on the invention and the innovation of graphic visualization in order to ensure uh, the spread of electrification. So where the images spread, so too does electrification across the nation and to better integrate the technology into the um, American home. Uh, one way of looking at this is that these um, uh, images that kind of float around in all kinds of different publications uh, tend to um, uh, create a kind of monopoly position. They create a kind of trademark like for electrification. And of course, the uh, pictograph has that kind of um, uh, modernist uh, efficiency, positivist kind of quality. Um, so that in many cases, uh, you can see um, that just like trademarks or just like in advertising, the pictograph kind of ignites the aura of the commodity brand, which would be tech, um, which would be electricity. And uh, there's also, I think, these innovations in terms of diagramming that I've become increasingly interested in. For example, um, this uh, piece from the collection, uh, the guide for members of the FSA cooperatives in which the spread um, is divided into two spatial units. One, the kilowatt hour uh, means to the farm home and what one kilowatt hour means uh, to the farm, two separate spaces of consumption and, uh, pro and, and production uh, to some extent. Um, so there still uh, is this question uh, about uh, how uh, these images continue to be uh, innovated in terms of communicating. This is still a statistical chart because it creates, it shows all that can be done with one kilowatt hour. All you have to do is add up the kilowatt hours and that's how much um, leisure, housework, and so forth you can do, or farm work. Um, what I think is interesting is that increasingly the pictographs uh, become forced into something like scenes of inhabitation. They do become more like illustrations and in some ways they become almost more photographic in terms of creating a, a slice of life on the farm. Um, so to sort of wrap all that sort of random stuff up uh, in terms of just my uh, thoughts from being here, I think one of the things that uh, sort of transpires here is that there's a way of negotiating how to take data points and how to apply them to living bodies, how to best convey something about uh, the life of rural Americans through the use of pictographic uh, representation. Um, there is, I think, the possibility to, move, to view the move from pictograph to photograph um, as something more than just a coercive technique um, of aligning rural American identity or subjectivity with the optics of the state, which would be what Adorno's critici damning criticism might be. I think um, that the transition from data points to living bodies somehow humanizes relief and rehabilitation. Um, I don't think that these two things are necessarily mutually exclusive either. I think the optics of the state and its production of a particular kind of subjectivity are equally um, uh, engaged in uh, humanization and relief and rehabilitation. Um, I think that there are two sides of the same coin and I, th I think in many ways what the, the, the challenge is to try and make good on both those sides. So thanks for... Um, sitting through that.